Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Joanne Smith. Joanne is president of Price to Profits Consulting and formerly head of the uh, DuPont Corporate Head of Marketing and Pricing. She's also author of the Price Negotiation Playbook and the Price and Profit Playbook. She focuses on helping B2B companies transform their pricing performance. At DuPont, she was instrumental in creating the pricing organization, which transformed DuPont from weak to outstanding pricing performance. So with that, Joanne, welcome. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here with Leverage Point again. And in this discussion, to be talking about those tough price pressure um, discussions that we so frequently have. And you know, most salespeople, almost on a daily basis, are hearing from their buyer some form of, I only care about price, you're too high, you're the highest, you're the same, you have no value difference, or I don't care about your difference. They're talking about things to try and undermine the confidence of our salespeople in our price point. And the fact is they do it because they are so frequently successful in getting that salesperson to over discount. So let me just talk a little bit about evidence that would suggest they are successful, that we do routinely over discount. And I'll start with, with a scatter plot. If you were to think about any of your top products that you sell broadly, and think about the price difference between one customer and another, I'll bet you find you have a very high uh, scatter of prices, and that there are some big customers that get exceptionally low price. You probably have medium and even small customers that get a uh, big price variance, if you will. So we know that those low end prices are a situation where we have dropped, we've discounted more than we need to. In fact, as I'm doing consulting projects, I'll bet you about roughly 99% of my clients, when I'm looking at data and their scatter plots, I am seeing 30, 40, 50, 60% price spreads at times across customers. So we know it's happening. Now let me turn to a couple other surveys that also indicate that buyers are successful in getting us to uh, over discount. This uh, one I mentioned here is from Simon Kucher, where they found that roughly 80% of the thousands of companies they surveyed, the companies thought they were more expensive than their competitors. 80% randomly selected. Guys, that's like literally impossible, right? They didn't just randomly select all the high priced companies. If we were to really look at this, most of us have at least three to five global competitors. Likely the answer is the max it could in reality be is 20 to 30% of uh, companies are really more expensive. So we know that the large majority of people that answered that question were flat out wrong. They are not on average more expensive, yet buyers have convinced them that it's true. Here's one from the Bay Group. 75% of salespeople believe the buyer has more power, not them, right? They don't have the confidence. Now, let me turn it to a survey that I do whenever I'm tra training marketing and sales teams. I always ask them up front, what's their price negotiation skills? How would they self-rate? And actually, I find that greater than 90% of those folks grade themselves as mediocre at best, mediocre to weak on their price negotiation skills. So buyers are beating them up. They have no confidence in their own abilities. It's no wonder we over discount. And maybe the last piece of evidence I would suggest in proving that we over discount is with some rather small amount of training or consulting experience to help overcome, to get better at negotiation skills. We can immediately see companies begin to put real dollars, make smarter decisions, higher price decisions successfully. And I will come back to that and give you some real numbers later 
in this talk. But it's just another indication how quickly we can turn around um, this situation, proving that we are over discounting. Now, when I talk about price negotiations, I want to let's let you know that if I ask those same salespeople how they feel about sales negotiation, they usually rate themselves very high. Often I'm working with a pretty ex, uh, experienced uh, sales team. So let me use some really gross simplification in what is the difference when I talk sales versus price negotiations. For sales, it's usually about how do I win this deal with high success and do so in a way that maybe builds the relationship for my future dealing, sustainability with that customer. When we talk price negotiations, it's not just winning the deal, it is winning that deal at the highest fair and appropriate price. And it is also not just about that deal. It is doing so in a way that sets us up for future deals and high price. In other words, done in a way that minimizes price aggression in the future. Because every time we discount at one customer, it sets us up for competitors hearing about it and getting more price aggressive or other customers hearing about it and pushing us down, or other salespeople saying, well, gosh, if John was able to discount here, I should be able to discount over here. So price negotiation has a little more of that strategic long-term view that sets us up for more success. All right, and as I speak further about this, if I think of that drawing in that center, that brown like ladder-like framework, if I picture that as the sales negotiation framework that many of sales teams are taught in varying training courses. When it comes to price negotiation, it's an add-on to that basic framework. Basically what I'm saying is the sales framework that we often learn is good stuff. We're gonna add some hooks that make it even stronger to get our fair price. And I will tell you that I have the sales framework that we often learn is good stuff. We're going to have a sales negotiation book that properly pulls in all these extra nuggets that we need to also get our fair price. So as I go forward, I'm going to talk particularly about those nuggets and assume a certain level of understanding of basic sales negotiations. And this price pressure framework, this five step that I'm about to introduce, it applies whether you are talking that to the left of this screen, which is the unique, a unique offering, whether it's a brand new offering or an existing offering, we can apply it. It also works extremely well if we're just doing, let's say our annual increase, we're taking all products up 3% this year or on everyday pricing, even on undifferentiated products. So this five step, and again, I'm gonna focus on the kind of the price hooks on this, and I will talk in depth about these steps. One, about how do we diffuse and get away from price so we can begin to talk two, about needs, three, about sharing some teachable moments, some insights that lead them to accepting our product at its fair price? Or how do we really identify the buyer type so we get down to the right options and so that we understand our power in step five so that we're negotiating that final price with the appropriate confidence in what we're doing. Yet before we go into that five step, always for success, I say we're We've got to pre-plan that negotiation. If we know it's going to be a tough one, then we ought to pre-plan. And I'm a proponent of actually doing it, you know, in writing. Quick Excel that answers certain questions. And I use a checklist that has roughly five questions in four different categories from understanding the customer, customer pushback, offering design, what's going to be my opening offer, 
and my negotiating strategy, my walk away position, things along that uh, line. And as I talk through this five step process, every time there's a, a particular hook that relates to price, you'll see that little symbol or where it was, you'll see, I'll use this checklist symbol when I say, this is something you should have pre-thought out. So let me also point out that the checklist that uh, I use, you know, 70% is probably similar to what you would find in any sales negotiation course. 30% are those extra hooks, those things we have to prepare for the price side. And I will also just kind of point out that for the really tough ones, I suggest you fill it out and then you do a role play internally. <laughs> One salesperson to another or to their manager, nothing like that to really get your confidence in the right position before we enter these tough conversations. All right, and as a guiding principle behind any negotiation, I'm looking to do it in a way that we build trust, and we build a sense of fairness between us and our customer. So I want that customer walking away feeling that they were listened to and understood. I want them walking away thinking, hey, that supplier really knows how they add value to me to help me win, to help my company win. But I also want them walking away knowing that you as the supplier, as a salesperson, are looking for fairness to both parties, that you are looking to be equally and fairly compensated for your, your product, your offering, your innovation, as well as sharing value with them. So with that, let's go to step one. This is the diffuse that price pressure and redirect. So my little picture of the babies, the one on the left, the one that's whining, that is your customer whining about your price is too high, the premium is not right. And here in this step, what we have to do is show empathy for that customer, not sympathy. We do not have to agree with him, but we have to emphasize that that is in fact an important issue for them. And we actually have to verbalize, right? Something like, hey, I understand you're telling me price is most important. This premium is a concern of yours, and I am going to address that. But in order for me to do that in the best way to meet your needs relative to price, can I first ask you a few questions? And then we're ready to go on once we get that acknowledgement. The pitfall I see here is that if you haven't actually got that okay to move on, then what's going to happen is you can be talking about your value story or whatever your story is to the cows come home and that customer is not listening to you because they don't feel you've yet heard them. They're in their head thinking, how do I get this supplier to realize that I'm telling them this price isn't right? So we have to acknowledge it so they know we understand it get their okay, and then they're in the game. They can listen to the rest of the conversation um, effectively. Now, step two is uncovering needs. These would be non-price needs and price. Your standard salespeople, they know how to ask about non-price needs, what's important, et cetera. I will, however, point out that this is an area that they have to have pre-thought about what are those needs. In be part, because those customers that push us back hardest on price are usually the type that will tell us nothing about their needs because they are afraid if we know about their needs, we will use it against them in the price negotiation. So when, we have pre-thought out those needs, we can use hypothesis-driven techniques, right? So if they, we ask these questions, we're getting nowhere, and perhaps we believe yield's important, we might go to our hypothesis-driven approach, which would be something like, now most of my customers, my other customers, tell me that yield's an issue. In fact, uh, we believe they're having yield issues of five to 10%, 
and it's important for them to improve this. Is that not important to you? Right? So we get them to react to something and we're much more likely to get them to open up and tell us something when we do that hypothesis driven issue. But what I really want to point out here is this where you see that little symbol of the ladder, the price hook um, even more here is that we often assume we know why they're pushing back on price and we don't ask. And that is really kind of a pitfall because there is so much information we gain in asking about price. So first off, I hope when you ask, you are either face to face or you're on some Zoom where you can see their face. You're on a camera. Because when you ask that, there are going to be a lot of suppliers that are for a second are going to look like that deer in the headlight, that moment where they hesitate and think, how do I answer it? Because it's a tactic. They don't really have an answer. It's, oh, well, I just tell every single supplier that because it works. And you'll be able to pick that up in body language. And it's going to be one of your first signs that they're using tactics versus real issues. But then as we get them to answer it, they could answer that in, in far different ways. And I'm going to just name four. They could say something like, well, I can't accept that uh, price because I sell on low price and therefore I have to buy on low price or I can't accept that because I believe my own competitors are getting better prices. Or they might say, well, I can't accept that price increase because I will not be able to pass it along. I'm going to have to eat that. Or, hey, as a buyer, I'm measured on my ability to keep my prices low. Those are just four examples that you would answer in very different ways. And, it's also giving you insight as to the true buyer type. It's uncovering tactics versus real price buyers, which is going to be important later in our uh, negotiation framework. So with this knowledge, it turns us to step three. This is the teaching moment. This is where we have to uh, perhaps talk about our value case if we are selling a unique product. If we're doing, say, a broad-based increase or annual increase, this might be more of the story that is, what is the rationale? Why is it fair and appropriate that we move price in this way? Here's what's happening in our industry. Maybe even taking that story into how it affects your customer's industry and their ability to move price. So in this area, if we really think about it, this is certainly an area you have to pre-think -think out because ideally you would have this teaching moment in writing. In writing is so much more powerful than verbally. Two, if we wanna do this at its best form, then we don't wanna just do this qualitatively. We are best when we can actually take, as an example, the value story into a fully quantified value. And when I say quantified, I mean in the eyes of the customers, financial terms. So I'll just give you a, a couple of examples here. And here is, say, a value story from uh, one of my clients. And of course, I've simplified it and modified it so, you know, we don't know who that customer is. But say a five-step story in this case. And they, in this particular industry, by the way, three main competitors, all 100% commoditized products, and all of them had major unexpected maintenance outages that happened throughout the year that often stocked out their customer base. Fairly tight market. So here's how the story went. The customer issue, you know, 80% of our customers indicate supplier reliability is a critical priority. So our customer bases see that. I'm showing then supportive data. Here's four years of all the key competitors and how many major outages we all suffered. So you can see, no doubt, that that's why customers are so, um, it's such a critical thing because it happens frequently. 
oh, and by the way, my, my client was the lowest bar. They had the least amount of outages. Then what is the cost of that customer issue? This is like the heart of value pricing here where we quantify in the customer's terms. So the chart would say basically, for a customer of your size, when we look at the cost of these outages, you've got lost production and revenue. You have quality issues as your operation goes down. You have rush freight as well as now higher inventory because now you've got to buy from a spot market to make up for the supplier being uh, down. You might have overtime pay. So the typical customer your size is seeing $135,000 of lost profit for each major outage. Now, then that's got to take them to our solution. So here's our value add. The alternative price is this, and we are offering a priority supply for a limited amount of our customers. It's worth a 20% price premium, but in our solution, we are only charging a 5% premium that offering all the way to the left for a select number of customers that will get priority service, will have priority inventory to manage you through these tough times, all right? So that's a value story that leads back to the customer, uh, to, to, excuse me, to the supplier offer. Now I'm gonna show you uh, another version, and this will turn more towards my own consulting, if you will. And I'm gonna start with training courses. And I'm talking about this because early in this talk, I told you that I would give you some insights as to how quickly with the right training, we can turn that into profits for ourselves. So if I'm telling a value story, I might start with those charts that I started this talk with about how excessive discounting happens and sales don't have the confidence and skill to see through those buying tactics. And then a little harder to quantify when we're only doing a training course, but I can begin to use actual quotes that are third party. There are client quotes. And as you can see in several of these, you know, here's a quote where within a week of training, a salesperson called me to say they closed the deal at $150,000 higher because of what they learned in the training course. The one beside it, literally in the middle of the training course, I had two people during afternoon breaks change deals at the higher price and win them to the tune of $27,000 in the day of the training. Just two weeks ago, I had a customer, I mean, a salesperson call me two days after training and tell me how they just won 15,000, higher than what they thought. So now I'm using quantitative in a semi-qualitative way to begin to show in the customer's area that there is in fact real dollars. Now, if I were to take that to more training consulting where I'm still talking one to three weeks, and I told you earlier how there can be big dollars in getting our skill set up here. I've taken five of my clients, all plus or minus a billion, ranging from automotive market to construction to agricultural equipment through chemical, the one th a commodity through specialty. The one thing they all had in common was very aggressive markets. And a couple of years where they were unsuccessful or very low success in raising price, most of them therefore having margin squeeze. And in that one to three weeks, always a training component, sometimes a consulting component, they successfully for the first time began to put price increases to the tune of, and these are their reported dollars back, $100 million, $25 million, $32 million, greater than $35 million. The one in the middle wouldn't tell me the exact, but they did tell me it was their first uh, highly successful increase in over five years, right? So just another indication where we can teach right to our strengths by beginning to talk in terms of the benefit to the customer in their financial terms. All right, so moving away from the teaching aspect, let's go to step four, 
which is one of the ones that I see done the least well and often not done at all. And this is the area where we have to identify the buyer type accurately, right? And then as we identify that, we do it because we're gonna have different tactics we're going to use for different buyer types. And we are going to present our offering in a different way. So we're gonna need this. And absolutely, we are also going to have different price power, which I'll talk about in step five. So understanding that buyer type, and in the B2B world, there's usually about four kind of standard buyer types that are out there of different value that we would treat differently. But we don't have an hour or two to get into that discussion. Let me just say, at least, we wanna tease out what I'll call the price buyer. And just one, one little trick here amongst many is to say to that buyer you think is a true price buyer, uh, look, if I could remove you know, this service or this feature of the product to get you a lower price, would you be interested in that? And if that answer is absolutely, I want lowest price, you know, they probably are a real price buyer. But if they start to defend why they need that service, why they need that better feature, you know you have pricing power. It gives you insight as to the buyer type. So ultimately, if we get that buyer type right, it's gonna help us understand, do we put our lowest software out on the table as a starting point, our highest? or this type of customer, are we better putting options on the table? Now, I would say in this particular area, once again, we should have pre-thought out what we think they are, because throughout step one, two, and three, we're using every piece of that information to verify in our head, to test tactics, and whether they really are the type of buyer we think. But the real pitfall here is either not identifying the buyer type or believing that so many buyers are price buyers when they are not. And I see this in training courses all the time when we talk about um, this particular session. I always have them work on some of their customers and tell me buyer types before we go into it in depth. And then we do training and then we have the discussion again. And a large part of sales through leaders fall for tactics that make them think they're talking to price buyers when they are not, right? And the bad part about that is, if you believe they're a price buyer when they're not, you're gonna back off price more than you should. And this takes us then to step five. We've worked out the value, we've got the right offer on the table, we are now already knowing we're talking about the right, the right piece. And now we're down to that final kind of price actual negotiations. And the critical thing here is to come in understanding your pricing power and with integrity standing up for your pricing power. If you've done the other four steps right, you already have a great sense whether you should be holding firm, moving off it a little bit, or whoa, this might be the true price power where you don't have near as much price power, All right? And we've got to use it. The pitfall that I see here is too many salespeople uh, are unwilling to uh, risk volume. At the end of the day, they either think because of their leadership position or their own personal position, they are desperate for that volume and it shows in the negotiations. And when it shows, boy, that buyer's gonna pick up for it and they're gonna make you over discount. I always say in this step, we need the carrot and the stick. The carrot is all the nice things we reiterate about how our price is fair for the value we deliver, how our price is fair relative to how we price to our other customers. We're not disadvantaging them. And then the stick might be amongst the other things, but here's like the, the ultimate stick. You know, if only price matters, we might not be your best choice for this application. 
Wait, what a powerful thing to be able to say and believe, right? Because once once we're there and that customer is clear, heck, we're not going to move. We are not desperate for price. We actually have a level of integrity to our value. We not only build trust, but we break down some of those tactics and really get them to pay fairly for price. Of course, at the end of the day, there are times when we have to actually do that and walk away. And that is our better deal. So that every future deal with this customer and the rest of the market is at higher price. So obviously we need to pre-plan here. So we know, and we pre-thought out that opening position in price and concessions we will or will not make and our walk away position. So as I talk through that five step, and, and again, it's plies in value or just broad-based increases, this price pressure negotiation that I just talked to can be applied very easily. Right away, it can help salespeople do a better job. But I do have to say, it is like the tail end of price negotiation skills, right? So it can be even more powerful when our uh, sales and marketing have some stronger skills in this area. And just to give you kind of a little, you know, teaser on that, if I'm talking about value pricing, value selling, right? There's a lot of work in my, uh, my course, my first one through four, around how we quantify and set price and validate it with the market and handle challenges and customize it to the customer before we ever get down to the value marketing and selling. And even in that section, it's just the last thing that culminates in having that discussion, right? Up here, we're really getting our value story for step, step three. We're learning down here about buyer types. So we really need that for the ultimate strength. And if we're just talking basic uh, annual increases, everyday price across our thousands or hundreds of products, you know, a training in that area has many steps, right? And towards the end, once again, is that pr price pressure negotiates, having the final discussion, but right before it is that thing called what what should we do? What's the intelligence say? Should I have the discount here or not? And how do I intelligently do that? And in a moment, I'll just show you a little quick framework because there would be easy ways to do it. Unfortunately, the easy ways all rely on us having some of the fundamental knowledge, some of the more strategic issues of understanding how to influence the market, our competitors and our cost and under, um, excuse me, our competitors and our customers. How do we understand price volume trade-offs? How do we and our marketing and leadership employ best practices so we're set up for the best success? How do we understand those buyer types so critical and understanding buyer tactics? So ultimately, we prepare for this negotiation with the right mindset. You know, and I usually use a framework that's about 11 point question, right? That's a, that we ask ourselves in like three minutes, I can take any price situation. Anybody on this phone could give me their toughest situation. I could talk through this framework and with confidence tell you under that scenario, you should drop, you should hold, you should drop a little, you should drop a lot, you should walk away. So it's that kind of framework where buyer type, you got to understand the basics to do that accurately. Product uniqueness, you got to understand price volume trade-offs, competitive reaction, what that does to your whole strategic side of things. All right, so that's a skill set when we have that and we link it with our price pressure negotiation, then our sales people have the most confidence to truly hold firm to truly see through tactics that are out there. And I'll just say like one last thing, whatever we do, any of this training that I talk to, you know, and it takes marketing and sales and pricing, right? Because every single deal that's out there, 
that we might assess and understand what is the right thing for that deal can have unintended consequences. It affects every future deal, right? And it could, if we over discount, strategically undermine what we might be trying to position a brand new product like, or it could undermine an annual increase, right? It can create a more difficult situation going forward. So we need to keep that in mind. And uh, as a last slide, I will just say that if you wanna learn more, my book's a great source. I also offer online courses in uh, the Professional Pricing Society and actually have a live uh, webinar, excuse me, full day training. It's actually virtual, so it's spread across two days that um, if you're interested, you could take that course via the professional pricing society and of course i do you know directly on-site training and consulting with with companies for those that really want to get into it in a much deeper uh way and so with that that's kind of the conclusion of that um talk and and nick maybe i turn that back to you Great. Uh, thank you, Joanne. That was awesome. Um, and we've had a few questions come in during the session and there's still plenty of time to enter them. So um, if you want to do that, just go ahead and enter them in the right hand go to webinar panel. Um, if you do so, you'll be entered to win a copy of the Price Negotiation Playbook, uh, which uh, we have a copy of here uh, we, and we love. So make sure um, you do enter. And to give everyone a couple more minutes to uh, enter their questions. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brian Hannon, who is VP of Sales here at Leverage Point, and he's going to share briefly how our cloud platform can help your marketing and sales teams across these um, all the steps of these price pressure negotiations. So, with Brian, I am going to give you presenter rights. Great, thanks, Nick. Uh, so, as Nick mentioned, I'm going to show a very quick demonstration of Leverage Point. You know, a lot of what Leverage Point does aligns very well with uh, with what Joanne does and, and with what Joanne talked about over the past uh, half an hour or so. Uh, you know, one of the slides that she had towards the end of her presentation around the value pricing workshop that she does, a lot of those decisions and a lot of that knowledge that's created in that exercise, uh, I think she had steps one through five where five was value selling. A lot of that can go into a value story, which I'm about to show you right here. And the goal with the value stories is really to, to make it even more effective uh, to have a conversation with a customer so that you can, you can talk about the things that you want to talk about at the right time and present them in a way that uh, hopefully makes the conversation go as smoothly as possible. And uh, the other thing that, that jumped out at me, she, she talked earlier in her presentation about you know, having a hypothesis-driven conversation when a customer may be a little hesitant to participate or to provide information to the salesperson. Uh, we actually take that same approach as well when we create value stories, uh, and we call that a, a case study approach. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So what you're seeing here is a leverage point value story. Uh, Dean Chemicals is a fictitious chemical company that makes automotive coating for cars, uh, basically paint for cars. And um, this is what a typical value story looks like. So this is being presented in a browser and there's a value model that's driving the, the math. But what the customer sees is something that they would normally see in, for example, a PowerPoint presentation, but it's interactive and digital. So the salesperson can change the data as the conversation happens and be able to gather additional data or make changes based on the feedback from the customer. So typically these value stories start with a high level discussion around what are the key value drivers that this particular offering has on an average customer. And as I mentioned, the case study approach is a way to present your value to your prospect or to your existing customer and start to talk about how you've impacted another company within their industry. Uh, 
Uh, and, and what this allows the salesperson to do is to make assumptions based on maybe average data that they see from across the customer base. And it doesn't require necessarily a lot of questions up front, but it does encourage questions as you're going through the presentation. And the, the benefit of a case study approach is that you can start to customize the presentation as you're talking with your prospects. So maybe today we're talking with BMW, we start to talk to them about how we've impacted another company within their industry and they start to say, well, you know, we do uh, manufacture more cars per year than the one you have here. And, you know, we use more material on our car than they do. And so as you're gathering this information, what you see is the value story starts to change. And of course, it starts to change in a way that becomes more specific to the prospect that you're speaking with. Then within this value story, we drill down into each of the value drivers individually and really discuss the, the background, why we feel this is an area of value for our average customer. Maybe we start to have a back and forth conversation about whether this does apply or doesn't apply to BMW. And in fact, they may tell us, well, this one does and this one doesn't. And here's the data that makes this one apply even more than what you have here. So we might go through each of, each of these individually. We might make changes based on maybe they think we're overestimating certain benefits. Um, and we can have that agreement back and forth. The benefit that you get here is once you get towards the end of a conversation, uh, you start to get an agreement about a potential value story. In fact, one of our customers does this as part of their standard customer engagement process. What they'll do is they'll have a value conversation in, uh, in the spring, for example, with the operations folks at one of their customers. And the, really, the, the conversation is just focused on value. They're not really talking about the price of their offering at all yet. But when they get to contract negotiation, they now have a sample value story that they've created that they can use when they are talking with procurement. So now they, when they're uh, having the discussion with procurement, they can pull out a value story that has been developed with the operations people, maybe even three to six months prior, and be able to then start to introduce uh, price and maybe they know what a competitor might be charging, or maybe they're trying to replace uh, a competitor in certain production lines within this, uh, this BMW um, automotive manufacturing factory. And they've already gone through the various value drivers, so they've identified what those are. And you know, with this type of a tool, you can look at uh, the value on a you know per vehicle basis, on a on a per annual basis, based on you know 100,000 vehicles here, and they're able to then present this data in different ways. They're able to hold off on presenting price until uh, until they're ready, and then they have a value story that they've collaborated with the customer on, and then hopefully their their uh, operations person or even procurement now has a, a strong value story that they can present to their management, which says, hey, we're making a good decision here to stick with this supplier. We're making a dis good decision even to pay a, a, a small premium and a price increase this year because we're getting significant value over our, our uh, alternatives from another, another supplier would give us. So here we have a PDF export that we can, uh, that we can pop out. So that's a quick uh, quick demo of Leverage Point. We're happy to uh, schedule these offline as well. So feel free to, to let us know at the end. And uh, Nick, I will pass this back to you. Great. Um, thank you, Brian, for showing us, uh, giving everyone an overview of the tool. And like Brian said, you can actually um, enter in the survey after the webinar if you'd like to schedule a demo of Leverage Point with us, if you'd like to hear from Joanne. So just another good reason to fill out the survey at the end. Um, so now it's time for the Q&A. So, uh, Joanne, you ready? Uh, I am, yes. All right, let's start with this one. Uh, so I saw, I think someone's referencing the stat earlier that 90% of the sales reps that self-rate their negotiation skills as weak and mediocre. Um, how many of those are actually weak or mediocre? <laughs> A pretty direct question. Um, and what skill gaps do you see? And what, what was the second half? 
what are the most common skill gaps that you see? Oh, okay. So when I look at um, these, I typically train very experienced sales teams, particularly uh, U.S. and Europe. Maybe when I'm in Asia, they're a little bit of a younger crowd. But rule of thumb, most of the time that I am with experience, like greater than 10 years, they're usually in and around a three. When I see that a three out of a five, okay, so that's a one to five scale. It is usually the people that give me the ones and twos tend to be five years or less in sales where I see it go uh, that week. And in terms of the uh, skill set as I go through that, I see it across the board because uh, price negotiations are so many pieces that add up and build on each other that collectively come together to make the right um, decisions, to know when to have confidence, when to discount, when not, how to present, et cetera. So uh, I really can't say there is one area that they are weaker in. I would have to, <laughs> I'd have to give you a handful of things. Um, no, that's to fair. Really, uh Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I say uh, I, I thought you were wrapped. Sorry, keep going. No, I, I'm I'm done. I don't want okay. to spend all. I could keep going oh, on no. on that. But we, That's sorry, fair. I, I had another really good one queued up. Then um, that was really interested in hearing what you would say to that. So. Um, so in practice, most of the time, you, the customer issues are often clear, but um, supporting data is hard to get. Um, so how do you bridge that gap when it's difficult to um, get specific data to support um, uh, some of these customer issues? Yeah, so that's uh, typically when I'm working with a business that is developing their own value price, and I think that's predominantly in a, a value pricing question, we are hypothesizing early on all of our value we're making guesses at this data that we do not have and then you've got to go to that hard part of market validation uh, and lots of companies really stumble in that um, area the one thing i would say in just a few minutes is when we have hypothesized it we can do uh, use the hypothesis driven techniques with customers who typically wouldn't tell us anything that would allow us to learn more. But there are many different techniques depending on what the issue in the data is that I use with groups, which can run from uh, hiring somebody that's from the industry, retired from the industry to fill gaps in perhaps, uh, using reference data that is similar but yet different and, and using it as an example of what we might expect to find in our particular business. So it's a hard one to answer in a direct way, but hypothesis driven is a really strong technique. And then some of the hiring, and there are uh, ways to be able to use certain consulting firms ra rather cheaply to be able to get at experts in almost any field you have to get you some level of uh, data. Yeah, and um, here when, when we're talking about using the leverage point tool, we often say um, getting it good is 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 more important than getting it perfect the first time because oftentimes that will bubble up in your discussions with customers. Um, oh, Nick, you're perfectly, you're right on the money there. You do not need perfection. You need to be in the ballpark for a credible conversation, and that will lead to really good refinement with the customer as you nickel and dime it into a little bit uh, tighter position. Mm. Yep, that's, 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 uh, that's exactly right. Um, and so this one's, um, this one's on value. So someone, I, I'm seeing someone ask, where in the process should value be introduced? And I'm assuming that means the, um, the five stages. And how does, um, the, uh, does uh, quantifying value impact the results of the, uh, your negotiation framework? Uh, OK. So. Uh, once again, this is probably a question where we're asking not because of a broad-based annual increase, but because of maybe a new product introduction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the framework that I uh, brought forward was a price pressure framework. So step five is really diffusing uh, price pressure. 
and a lot of times we're introducing new pro uh, products and whatnot, you may not be starting right with that storm right in your face with pr price pressure. And you can skip that phase, perhaps, right? And you can go into needs before we go into and use that as an opening in value. So understanding needs is a part of the value story before we begin to tell um, our value story. The key is whenever we can, we want to tell that value story before we start talking price to the extent that we can get away with um, that. And I think, you know, the leverage point tool is another way that helps us do that. My step three was really the value story. So if I was um, using a leverage point system, as an example, I would begin to perhaps use it in step two as I'm figuring out their needs so I know which tabs I'm going to open. And step three, I'm telling that whole value story and digging into those steps and customizing it. And then, and so th that quantification, uh, Nick, as you know, it's kind of huge in mm -hmm. really turning around the price. And when we can quantify that value, not only are we more successful in making the sale with confidence to the sales, to the uh, customer, salespeople are more confident uh, in doing that, you know, as well. So we're going to get the higher price. And by the way, when we do it, we're going to actually set a higher price because usually we surprise ourselves when we do that value case and we realize our value is much higher than we were initially thinking. Mm, yes, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I've got another one that is a long one, so I'm gonna do my best to condense it, but um, it's about channel partners and margins. So, uh, so often uh, the person asking this says that when the sale, when they increase price, the feedback they get from sales is that channel partners will lose margin. And that tends to blunt the momentum and leads to, you know, maybe a belief right or wrong that you'll lose a business. Um, how, do, how do you kind of, um, how would you negotiate that when, when dealing with resellers, channel partners and the like? Yeah, hey, great, great question. Can I just back up to one slide here as I speak to that? Yeah, Is that absolutely. Uh, I, right. I, yeah, I can do that right now. I, duh, 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 yeah. duh. Back up three more, I think. Keep going, keep going, keep going and stop here right so this is kind of when i'm you know i'm teaching a course and this channel partner thing absolutely comes out because it is sometimes that our value is two steps down the value chain and we're going through a distributor or uh, something like that that may not have the same value so maybe we're quantifying the value down there at whoever receives it and like when i'm training we this strategy challenges is step four, is how do we deal with those channel partners that may not see the advantage to them? In fact, it, they might, as you say, lose money while the next person in the value chain absolutely is wanting that, loving it, seeing the dollars. So there's different ways that we deal with that. And obviously I can just maybe touch on a few here in this, course and it can be anything from do we now move to um, pull strategy do we now start to sell downstream and get the pull through or somehow get specced in to get the pull through but one of the other things we're going to be thinking about is you know we want our channel partners to be healthy and usually if we can get a higher price our channel partners can get a higher price and we need them to understand that and see that and we might give them a little share in that, you know, if we decided that in our price premium, we created a certain amount of value and we get, we get to keep 40% of it, of that 40% that we might keep in price premium, I might take 80% of that in my price and give a little bit to that channel partner so that they're getting a piece of that value story. Much smaller if they're not, you know, the one adding any any true value if they're more just a pass through. But I'm looking to do that kind of fair compensation when it's appropriate with our partner and also perhaps looking at pool. And there are, uh, obviously are many other challenges, strategies that come up that 
that we need to think about and uh, strategically change pricing mechanisms or models to get around some of those channel partner issues. No, that, that makes sense. I think we have time for one more, if that's okay. Um, this one's actually a really interesting one about buyer type differences. So uh, assuming, um, you know, we, we I saw a stat recently that the number of um, uh, uh, people involved in a customer purchasing decision has just gone up over time. And so you've got buyers, users, purchasing, engineering, operations. Um, what, how do you handle these different buyer type preferences within these departments and maybe different perceptions of value or um, uh, value for what you're getting at a certain price? Yeah. So, you know, and it's an interesting and a, and a true kind of area that more and more people weigh in. Because folks, particularly buyers, don't want to be out there on that tightrope all by themselves and something goes wrong and the and there's something wrong with that product and it's all on them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we tend to want to do things by committee these days. It is also when you see that happening, a, a absolute sign that this is not a true price buyer. Because a true price buyer, a buyer can do all by themselves. They don't need a committee weighing in on value because value doesn't matter. It's about price. So when we see those multiple people, it is a good, good um, sign that we do deserve a premium and have value. Now, we got to sell that value to the key users, the ones that actually experience it, because if they understand the value story, they're going to be our advocates. And if we look at some of the studies, the biggest thing that drives whether the key decision makers and the and or procurement and it's usually, as you said, it's not just procurement, if there's a business leader with it. The key thing that drives them to making a decision is what the user group thinks about that supplier, what the user group is advocating. So you better be pre-selling down there at the users that receive the value. And the best way to turn those guys around to really uh, accept you is to be able to quantify your value or demonstrate your value so that they really understand um, what it does for them. Couldn't agree with that more. So um, I think that's a great place to leave it for today. So um, before everyone leaves, uh, just a reminder to pre-register for next month's webinar and the exit survey. Uh, we'll be joined by Michael Horwich and Simon Khan of SPMG. And we'll be exploring ways to capture recurring value and subscriptions through value-based pricing. So it should be a really interesting one. You definitely don't want to miss it. Um, so make sure you're pre-register. And that's it from us today. So thank you all for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. Special thank you to Joanne, as always, for another great presentation. And from all of us here at LeveragePoint, have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care. Thank you.